Hello and welcome to my Danganronpa reaction series. This is the third one. If you don't know what's going on by now, then it's like a podcast style where I take down notes during the episode and then do a bit of a ramble about my thoughts on each episode and the revelations, all that stuff throughout it. And if you're interested in that, then keep on listening. There'll be annotations if you want to jump to a specific episode on the side, the numbers, and you will be happy and good and stuff. And oh, I'm pretty sure I totally called Side Hope. This is like the last thing I'm recording for this episode, so I didn't know it for the uh, stuff before, but I totally called that. I think it was in my impressions video. I gotta double check, but I think I did. If I didn't, then I might be talking about my uh, talking out of my ass here, and that's okay too. That's okay too. Let's, let's just start. Welcome, welcome, confusing, confusing episode. So this is the episode, Ultra Despair Girls, where it mainly focus on Kamaru and Toko dragging down Monica. Oh, Monica, Monica, Monica. She seems a lot, oh, so much more like Junko than she was in the past. I know she wanted to be like her, but she's actually starting to take on some of that personality, some of those personality characteristics where she gets really bored of stuff and decides to just do whatever the hell she feels like because it will make her not bored. Which realistically is sort of how they painted Junko, not wanting to be bored, so she decides to create despair because it's so unpredictable, she won't be bored. And Monica's starting to become personality-wise more like that, so she's getting what she wants in some way, even though she doesn't really want it anymore, according to her, to me she's telling the truth. Okay, starting back at the beginning. First thing to note, Kamaru in the flashback has green hair. You know, I don't actually remember that being in the game, the green hair part. She has no hoge either, but I, that was in the game. She didn't have an hoge. You know, you can, like, retcon some of that, even if it was green hair, and I'm remembering that incorrectly. You can retcon some things when you change their design later. I mean, it's just, like, hair color and an hoge, really. You can change that. And it's also sort of funny how Genocide Jack is just as OP as she was in the game. After that, I noted what was probably my highlight of the episode, Mini Kamaru. She might be my new favorite character. I don't know why, but I something about her just like melded with me on a fundamental level that I just really, really liked. In general, yeah, it did seem like they had that typical relationship between Kamaru and Toko that was established in Ultra Despair Girls. Speaking of which, it is sort of weird that this was called Ultra Despair Girls, despite the um, Japanese game, wasn't it called Absolute Despair Girls and Ultra Despair Girls was just them shortening it for the English audience? Overall, the episode seemed mainly to establish that Monica's not part of it, again, if she's telling the truth, because she's sort of a lot more like Junko, and if she was being more like Junko, she'd be a hell of a lot more manipulative. So unless she is telling the truth, it's a, you can't take her word for, you can't just take her word as truth, basically. And if she has other motives, if she has something that isn't true in what she said, outside of maybe like getting Makoto to basically worry and worry about one of his friends dying and causing him to have more of a protective instinct that would actually cause him trying to create conflict, unlike what he was doing before where he's just like, please just believe me, please, we don't have to be killing each other. But if he has a protective instinct come up, he may actually try to choose sides instead of actually trying to play more of a neutral ground. And given the current uh, student council president's state, then that would definitely possibly cause one of his friends to die, or at the very least be the catalyst for that happening. And who knows, maybe Monica's doing that on purpose. Or maybe she knows something we don't know, because like I said before, she definitely doesn't seem like she's working on it by herself, whether she's the actual mastermind or not. Even if she wasn't telling the truth there, chances are there's more to it than that, more people involved. Overall, this episode was a, it just threw a big wrench into it. When everything felt like it was starting to get on track to this is how it's going to continue from here on, this just changed the game completely, and I'm really not sure where it's going to go from here, other than things just falling and falling into horribleness. Time will tell, though. Hello and welcome to this fast side episode 7. The episode where Junkyo puts Zero in a room and there's a lot of blood, and I'm not going to say much more than that before I go back to the beginning. Uh, one of the early things happened, it picks up almost immediately after the last Despair Side uh, episode left off when she met Animator, uh, Mitarai I think his name is, still trying to get names down, it's never going to end, trust me. And the first note I put down here was, oh you don't like anime do you Junko? You want to fucking fight about it do ya? 
<laughs> Maybe you wouldn't be so goddamn bored all the time if you tried it out. <laughs> oh, I was sort of just joking, but um, that's definitely a good way to piss people off and make, make a person seem more evil than they normally would. And then she pulls him aside, watches his anime, and learns the true power of subliminal messaging. Which really gets Junko excited. And it's sort of weird, because is he going to go despair? I mean, in the future arc, he clearly seems like he's not ultimate despair, and he has a clear understanding of how to manipulate people at that subliminal level, which is disturbingly close to what the ultimate despairs were supposed to excel at. He kind of pulled into all of that too, so this sort of seems like how she would have been pulled into the route of becoming ultimate despair, and her intense love for Junko that we see in Dying Europa 2. So if he doesn't go ultimate despair, that would be a bit weird. And then you have the student council situation. Yeah, I saw more students and it was just like, oh, another class. Oh, wait, no, maybe the student council. And then they confirmed it. Mind you, I haven't read Danganronpa Zero enough to know all the details of it, though I do know the majority of the plot twist in it. I just don't know like the series of events of everything that goes on and what happens when and how it happens. So this might just come earlier on, but I sort of had the impression things played out differently. So maybe they'll just expand on it in later episodes as more of the stuff that Dying Rope Zero covers is also um, done in this, possibly. But I do gotta say, damn, sometimes it only takes one, and it certainly escalated way too quickly to be realistic. I feel like I have to assume that I am forced to assume a lot about their conditions just because of how they presented it. Junko set up a ton of the shit we see in the first game by this point somehow, and I mean, why didn't they just try to wait it out? Why didn't they try to escape? Weren't there plate? Weren't there no plates on the windows this time? It really was presented really sort of weirdly, almost in like a montage-esque way, and we have to make a lot of assumptions. I want to give it the benefit of the doubt, but it sort of doesn't really set it up so that I really have a good reason to give it the benefit of the doubt other than it's Danganronpa. Mind you, I do think that Azura would have a much more significant role than just as an observer in it all. Hell, he didn't even kill anyone. I do wonder if he ever, ever will. I find myself most curious about him because he seems like he should be so straightforward, but with how he acts here, with the knowledge of how Dying Rupa 2 ends, and all the stuff from the future side, from Azura, from the ending with Hajime um, post Dying Rupa 2, and the part where Makoto met Izuru and all that just makes me wonder so much about exactly if he's going to go somewhere a little bit different than I think. And this ends on a sort of very somber note as it feels like the last bit of happiness is all but snuffed out. You have the Reserve Horse Uprising. I'm still wondering if there's going to be a direct connection between the two stories by the end of this. There are parts here and there with character backstories and whatnot, but so far there really isn't much, unless maybe it relates mostly to the Zero somehow. It's really hard to tell. Also, just a heads up in the future, future episodes, please less Nagito porn. Please and thank you. Okay, time for future arc episode 8. This is the episode where they find secret entrance again, Hat Sensei dies, saves Kyoko, and Byakua meets up with Yasuhiro, and they blow it open. Back at the beginning, you see this sort of flashback to some time with Hat Sensei where he was with another teacher fighting. It's unclear if it's like during the Ultimate Despair worst thing in human history thing, or if it was from like some other part of his life, but it certainly did seem intent at setting him up in a certain way at that point started to feel sort of like episode I think four where um pharmacy girl had her whole backstory basically revealed before dying at the end I will note that at the end of the flashback there was red blood yes red blood what is this blasphemy why does there keep there's so many just random shit in the past few episodes like at the beginning that just gets me so worked up for some random stupid reason I wonder why that is I wonder if they're doing it on purpose once we get back into the school we mainly have the situation with Makoto and the situation with Kyoko Makoto just figured out someone was going to die because of him, and Monica Bot seems to be in some sort of automated mode. It seems like it, because she was cycling through trying to identify people. The student council president guy shows up and calls them despair, which makes me wonder what he was told by the old man. Maybe he's hallucinating and seeing them as someone else. Maybe he's just gone that insane. Actually, you know what? I wonder if he was lied to by the old man. The old man was going to die anyways, or he knew he was going to die anyways. There's no sign of him getting poisoned, mind you. It's no possibility. 
Or maybe I'm assuming too much on how fair the game's rules really are. Maybe those who are in on it don't actually have to stop doing their forbidden actions. There's no clear sign if it's automated or if there are people watching and activating when they see someone do it. So if you did that, then you could easily say, no, nah, I don't feel like it this time. Because if you could use that truth to assume that those forbidden actions are truth and you will die if you do that, if you assume that and you, do and you are able to get around that somehow, then you could use that to your advantage big time. Also, it's curious, why would Monica Bot be protecting them? Maybe it's just a directive to protect them like in an automation program? Or maybe it was like how I was saying a number of episodes back and Makoto's really part of the Mastermind's plan, sort of how like the president was talking about. And whoever's the mastermind of this really wants Makoto to live. You have to consider that Monica is still in Toa City, well, was in Toa City, and she clearly isn't the one setting this up, assuming she's telling the truth. Still sort of assuming that. I, I, think, I don't think there's any reason to doubt her at the moment. So this Monica bot really would have had to been set up and is currently being controlled by whoever basically set up the game and have to do the mastermind so they're going to the mastermind's will you also have kyoko's group that is investigating the blacksmith's death only for the boxer to show up cause some issues and i don't doubt hat sensei at all i drop all those doubts we know he's a friend of the headmaster that's about it and it really does set that whole um beginning part of the episode where it was him when that flashback it never contextualizes it it doesn't Kyoko's deductive speech was pretty, well, satisfying, honestly. And I actually, it's an, actually an entrance. I got the impression, when I heard secret entrance beforehand, I got an impression that it meant like a secret room. And that would explain why Sweet's Girl would go out of her way to kill Blacksmith Girl. Hmm. I'm sort of losing my feeling that any of the actual people still alive are involved. Feels more like they're being manipulated with their forbidden actions and whatnot instead. And we end the episode on the big explosion as Byakua shows up, gets the Asahiro, and they detonate their way into the collapsed building, only to trigger a trap with a bigger explosion and everything falling down. Now, Makoto and Hina actually felt it, so that idea that they're actually in a different place might not be so valid anymore, because you'd have to feel it for some reason, unless the mastermind somehow controls both and somehow has the ability to make them feel it in a different area. I, assume, I, I think it's a safe assumption that they're in the same area at the very least, if not in that big part that was falling down. Probably not that big part that's falling down. Ultimately, not a ton happened. It was more about revelations over motives and starting to give people reasons to clear their name at this point. In fact, I'd argue that no one in the game currently seems capable of being the killer. The president seems too out of his mind. Boxer felt legitimately surprised by all the events and Kyoko's revelations that she deduced. And Monica Bot was under Monica's control the whole time, right? I'd be hard pressed to think the animators are actually capable of that either. And the rest are survivors from the first game, which I have a hard time believing they would be involved. Hmm, lots of questions still remaining. Also, final note, Kyoko, stop licking weird things. What if that saliva had poison in it? Come on, think it through. And welcome to Despair Side Episode 8. I don't really have a whole lot to say about this one, it's just a pretty engrossing episode in general. I mean, Going back to the beginning, it was a bit really, really abrupt seeing Mikan go full despair like that. The quick glance at the male lead from Danganronpa Zero was pretty cool. I'm not sure if they're going to explore that, that, that actual timeline in this and go into those details, or if they're going to keep it pretty exclusive to Danganronpa Zero and just have that as a background event going on. But overall, this just feels like the episode where things take a nosedive. This is the nosedive episode, and you can feel them. Like, um, I was thinking about it in the episode that sometimes when you're thinking about story structure and stuff like that, I'm not exactly, like, well-educated on, like, the more science-y, social science, like, concept, psychological parts of literary structure and stuff like that. But I know that there are some aspects of it that you typically imagine, like, like, uh, climbing into the, like, uh, like, climbing down into the depths. A sort of point of no return. That final ominous descent that brings you to that, like I said, point of no return, and ultimately is where everything goes wrong or goes right. And I gotta say, I'm actually sort of impressed by Nagito. Sure, he got outlucked in the end, which is amazing that that can happen. He did get outlucked in the end, but he was very quick to figure everything out and plan his attack and actually execute it. 
Insane or not, he truly does believe in himself enough to go through with these elaborate plans of his. Then you have Mirai, the animator. He, while he wasn't exactly in despair, he did seem pretty darn upset, which probably means he was pushed to the point that he had already finished doing Junko's work for her, which again leads into the whole, you know, into the point of no return aspect. Sort of all finished off with that moment where Chiaki recognizes Zuru as Hajime. Oh, that was just a little heartbreaking at the time. And I, I feel as though all the happiness... I said it last time, but the happiness was snuffed out. There's just a little itty bitty left here as they were looking around for Mikan and they are making jokes and shit like that. But now it really feels like that point of no return, which is probably about right for an episode 8 in the 12 episode season. And there really isn't much more to say. Despair is coming. It is. It is. Hello and welcome to episode 9 of the Future Side, and I actually have a lot of notes this time. This is the one where, let's just say, Sweets Girl died, Boxer died, Kyoko died, and did anyone start? And Monica Bot sort of died. Start off with a recap, which I actually found sort of funny because I think they were trying to like say, oh, this is gonna be a recap episode, you don't get to see any new stuff now, even though I thought they were talking about the summary first, and then they'll switch a route to something where I thought it would be in the first place, which was nice because you know what? It, there is a lot going on, especially going between the despair and future, trying to keep track of it all. I do like those recaps every once in a while. The big revelation early on is they're underwater. It makes you think, to have actually built that, it would require someone to have connection to the original construction. Kyoko suggested the president, but he seems to doubt through, through his actions and convictions. You also have the boxer who was right-hand man to president, and you also have Sensei who was so very close to him. The boxer, well, other than the fact that he fucking died, he seemed really surprised by it, so I seriously doubt he was knowledgeable of that. And yes, Sensei's dead, but at the same time, I'm sort of inclined to want to stick to the idea that maybe she isn't so as dead as she really wants people to believe. I don't know, just little things, especially from the Despair arc, um, especially when they went back and you looked uh, at her reserve course time and she like went into like a crazy frenzy when she was talking about it. It really made me think that she was talking like she had fallen into despair at some point, which based on the future arc seems like would have been an impossibility. I suppose the president being the one doing it all is possible. I did sort of suggest that before because he has his own ideals and he might want to use and manipulate people to actually create his ideals. And I suppose the old man could have correctly identified him as being in charge and that's what surprised him. But at this point it feels way too obvious with the info given. Especially when Kyoko basically outright says, oh it's probably him, which in Dangaropa speak usually means no, it's not him. The episode definitely felt like it was a descent into madness, especially for the president and um, the sweets girl. And <laughs> her last speech about never dying. Wow, so many death flags just rolling out of there. I will say, Kyoko's death definitely... It took me by surprise. I didn't see that coming. I'll take back what I said about them having the balls to kill them off, because this one does not seem like they're faking out. It does not. It does not seem like there's any way they could fake it out. Especially sucks because mm, they had just like sort of set up Makoto and Kyoko to have like that sort of like connection that you sort of got the feeling from from the first game, but clearly at this point it had developed quite a bit more, at least in their minds. And then she's gone. I also want to talk about partly because this is the last one of this part that I'd noticed at the in the opening it said nine people alive, Mako at least at the beginning Makoto, Hina, Kyoko, animator, president, boxer, sweet girl. I guess Monica Pot counts too, and that's eight people. And then you have to argue, does Hero actually count towards that? Yeah, he's in the opening, but I don't think he has a wristband. I don't think he's really been involved with anything at this point, so that makes me wonder. I just went back and looked through the deaths in the opening with like, um, when a certain character like flashes up and then they have basically them in the background silhouettes with a death position. Let's see. I, d I still don't know names, so warning in that. Kyoko was in a noose. This might be meant as a metaphor for practically committing suicide to keep Mikoto alive. Hina had the knife in the belly. We saw this already. It was a fake out. Blacksmith was burned at the stake. He's also upside down, so this might be like a metaphor for reverse betrayal. Pharmacy girl, uh, she has tons of like syringes in her. She died from a knife, but the drug certainly played a big part in her, well, causing her downfall. 
The boxer is basically cut in half with the president's swords all around him, so that seems appropriate. The old man, he's like strung up in like electrical wires. It does seem a bit odd, though at the same time you could say he was like strung up not by wires or anything. I don't think it was by wires. I think it was just by like a sword or a pipe at a point near the end of his death. So it does sort of mix into that though. It might be a bit weird. Uh, Sweets Girl is like like covered in ice and her body is shattered. I don't see the connection. The high pitched guy who died at the beginning has like the sort of poison visuals. I think it makes sense. Monica Pot was literally cut in half down the middle. It's basically identical how she died in this one, if you want to call it death. Sensei is in her like death position that was on the chandelier. But she has a ton of blood coming out from like her wrist. And this seems really weird as a detail to include, as her wrist, I don't think it played any sort of role in any of this. And that sort of implies like suicide in the same way Kyoko hanging herself did. The bull mask guy was strung up in chains. I don't remember his death exactly, but I think it had something to do with that. And then you also have Hat Sensei that seems to be bound up, like bounded up with duct tape and like completely covered in plastic wrap. It feels like this is supposed to be a metaphor too, but I don't, I don't see this one either. The ones that really don't make sense are the Sweets Girl, Hat Sensei, Sensei, and um, Old Man. I think the Sweets Girl is basically out of the picture. Her, her thing seems like it wrapped up relatively nicely. Well, not nice for her. And I don't think we haven't really seen much from Hat Sensei. Sure, he has a connection to Kyoko, but we didn't actually see him die. I guess he got the poison, but he just fell down a pit. The old man has been suspicious this entire time, the chairman. Um, so he might also have something to do with it. So basically, it sort of I, I do have this feeling that they're trying to play fast and loose with what they're showing you, trying to create expectations that aren't really there. And I'm thinking probably you can see sort of that coming out in the opening, especially with the count of people that are alive and how they suggest that they die. I don't really have anything concrete in my mind of what exactly it could be yet, but um, I think that's a good way to end it for this week. See you next time. Drive safely. Hmm. <laughs> Despair side episode dying. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, no. You can just feel as the trap is closing in and everything is going the way you don't really want it to go. You can just feel it. This is the episode where Sensei is put in the chair. And I will note, I really don't like the whole shorthand brainwash concept where it's like, Let's watch this video, and if you watch it for, I guess, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, maybe a few hours, then you will suddenly become despair. I was sort of looking forward to a deep look into how each of the classes, like almost tragic past or tragic personalities, were manipulated into their despairs. Because that's really what I took out of the second game, and that's that that is how they were actually brought to that point. It really just goes to the idea, like, they all get brainwashed with a video route, I'm... I'm not gonna like that. I, I can live with it, but I'm not gonna like that. I'm not gonna like that at all. The actual brainwashed scene with Sensei was disturbing in all sorts of ways. Oh, there was plenty of disturbing stuff in this episode. It was basically all disturbing stuff. It seemed like they were implying that Mukuro took out those and was like probing her brain, causing her to feel like pleasure. Like, at the same time that she was experiencing the despair from watching the video so that she'd associate with it. And that makes some sense in some way, but I could not... And it does make sense, especially for how Mikan seems to embrace the despair aspect of it. But in general, I just don't see that really melding with how the rest of the class seems to act. Especially from what little we've seen of the despair states, especially Nagito. He does not seem like the type who actually enjoys despair. Bear. He's just like messed up in the mind to the point where he sees causing despair as a way to achieve what he really wants. But the episode overall was just watching this trap close in. And you know it's a trap as soon as Mikan shows up with Pekko. And no one's questioning it. They're also caught up in the flow of the conversation. They lose their critical thinking and think, Oh, why is Mikan suddenly here? Why is Pekko is... Why is... Why is Pekko have a problem? They just go with like, Oh, we need to go save him. We need to have the discussion of hope and how much effort you're willing to put in to do all. I mean, it feels like they lost their critical thinking at that point. They start to head down to the bottom and... Ooh, 
Ooh, Mikan shows that that trap is definitely coming together. And Sensei finds Chiaki, and she gives that smile. Do I really need to say that her story is probably complete and utter bullshit? Because it seems like her story is complete and utter bullshit. And I really don't have much else to say on this episode, because it's... They already passed that point of no return, and you can feel, like, the implosion that's happening as it's happening. It's really slow. It's a really slow implosion, but it's... <laughs> it's like, I almost don't want to watch more, because I know what's gonna... I, I, like, I want to know what happens, and I almost don't want to watch more, because it's like... It really does invoke that feeling of despair through the anime. Sort of like how it is in the anime. I'm not gonna, like, suddenly crave despair or anything after this, am I? Am I? <laughs>